Welcome to Normalize PTSD. This week we got Mike. Uh, this one's going to be a bit of a mini series. We got Mike sharing his his journey and his process, as well as to touch on a bit of the support structure that he has around him. Uh, his wife tells her experience in dealing with it, as well as her spouse's group uh, that she was part of. And we're lucky enough to get Abby, who is going to be the leader of that spouse's group. And with that, Mike, if you want to take just a minute or two to just give us a little bit of history of who you are, where you come from, and how you got here. All right. Well, I I am the typical rural farm kid. I grew up in a town. I had a graduating class of 22, and I uh, basically I. I always knew from the time I was little, I must have been the third grade, I knew that I was going to join the Air Force. Um, I went to an air show in Billings. Yeah, I went to an air show the summer of 1985. And I only remember this because this would have been the summer like after Ronald Reagan was elected, reelected. So I was in Billings, Mo- Billings, Montana, and I went to an air show and I saw airplanes and I saw these cool guys doing stuff and they talked about how they get to travel the world and do fun stuff and fight the communists and well I was in I was in like there was that was it I couldn't have thought of a neater thing to do so uh right after I graduated high school that's what I did I didn't even tell anybody because I was 18 my senior year so I graduated high school and uh, I was like, oh, by the way, I joined the Air Force. I'm leaving in August. Yep, went and took the ASVAB on a weekend. <laughs> I was the only kid in my class to join the military. And uh, th- this is what I was going to do, like, from the time I was a little kid. So there was never any doubt in my mind. Do you feel like growing up uh, a little bit country uh, assisted you in making that decision to join the military? I mean, I can only speak for me. Like, when I grew up in the South, like, patriotism was really, really, I guess, noticeable. I mean, our mascot was the Patriots, you know? Yeah. I wish it was some deep and noble and dignified answer like that. That sounds real good. I hated farming. And if a career path was going to lead to me never, never seeing a bull or a hog testicle ever again, I hated, I hated castrating hogs. I just, I, I, I hate tobacco. Like tobacco is a filthy cross to pick. And no, I had no ambitions whatsoever of continuing on as a farmer. All the kids that I grew up around, I mean, it was tobacco or Vidalia sweet onions. So there was, their families had prosperous farms and we didn't have one. It was, did you ever cut tobacco so much that it made you sick? Because <laughs> I know I have. Yep. Oh, God damn. I made it to the end of my first row. Now, mind you, I'm like 11 years old, and I'm out there. But And everybody is hot, and everybody is covered from the tips of their fingers, the, uh, their neck, everything. They're covered with some sort of cloth. And I'm like, you guys are idiots. I was out there in shorts and flip-flops and I made it one row and I just ended up puking the whole rest of the afternoon. So it was terrible. I hated it. And I, 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 I've never been able to smoke. I've never been able to chew. My body remembers tobacco and it wants nothing to do with it. Yeah. It reminds me of growing up. Like we didn't grow up with a lot, you know, and I remember, uh, this one time, my mom, she took us out to uh, help pick potatoes, turned it into a game like it was Easter or something, like we were hunting for Easter eggs, and every potato got us like a nickel or something, and maybe that's a little bit why I joined too, because, you know, military wasn't awesome, I it was better it. than farmer. It was better than farming. <laughs> it was better than farming. We did it. So, yeah, like, there was never any prospects. Um, I was a really great athlete in high school. Um, I was a standout in track. So I had full – I had a Hope Scholarship in Georgia, so I had a full ride academically. And then I had an opportunity to uh, have my housing and food covered with a track scholarship. 
So I was all set to go to the University of Georgia and do fine. I eventually went to college and did great. But uh, um, all I wanted to do really was to chase girls and drink as much as I could get. And my, my dad had joined the Air, or the Army as a private, and he was a colonel at the time. And he's like, Mike, you're just going to mess it up. He's like, join the military, come back when you're ready. He's like, I love you to death, but you're a knucklehead. You are a damn knucklehead. And he's like, go, go, go get this out of your system. <laughs> and that's what I did. So, and then I wanted to be pararescue. Uh, I, I, I wanted a job. I, that was, I, I told the recruiter I wanted a job with hair on his chest. And he talked to me about pararescue, and I did not make it. I, those guys, those guys, they're beyond swimmers. I'm, I'm a decent swimmer. Like, I can go out and swim two miles, and it's fine. But these guys, well, they'll just, they won't use their arms for two miles. Like, they had, they had practically had gills. So they were all on swim teams and water polo players. And there was just, they were a breed apart. I didn't make it, and I ended up on the flight line for four years, extremely profoundly disappointed with the career I was in. But, but uh, loved the guys. I loved being in the service, and I loved being. I ended up in uh, Italy, so I loved the, the adventure of it. Um, I separated from active duty as a reservist, and then took a little time away from the Air Force, and then I went back, and I was going to take another crack at pararescue, and then I talked to a guy. Um, the recruiter says, "Well, we got a guy here on this base in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he let him talk to you a little bit." because this is kind of a cool job too. And there's a uh, explosive ordnance disposal, so bomb disposal. And uh, a guy named Travis Hargett, and he basically outlined what that career field was. And I, I was sold. I was like, all right, well, this is what I'm looking for. I just didn't, this is what I was looking for. It's just, uh, there's the challenge. The job was insanely cool. Like I, I, I was really into everything. And then uh, there was no swimming, <laughs> so uh, I had a chance. I had a chance. I, w- I knew it was an outside chance to even try to do the test to get back in the pararescue. So this one, I was like, nope, this this sounds like it is for me. And when I re-entered that uh, career field, um, I I have an inordinate amount of luck. So everything just hit like little gears in a clock for me. And one thing opportunity just laid out a series of follow on opportunities. And I got everything I could possibly want out of that career choice. Like just tons. Yeah. I'm right there with you. I didn't, uh, I didn't really go looking for EOD. You know, it was like, I did well in the ASVAP and it was the recruiters like, okay, well, you know, you could do this job. And I was like, lame. <laughs> and then there's like, okay, well, what about this one? I was like, boring. <laughs> And then he's like, ah, well, this one has a really high failure yeah, rate. Man. I don't know. Yeah, you get to work with FBI, CIA, you know, ATF, get to disarm bombs and blow stuff up. And I was like, you're lying. It's not a real job. And he's like, no, it really is. And it had the highest sounding bonus. So I was like, what? $15,000? That's like a yeah. million dollars. Yeah. It's a strange dynamic that the thing that hooked me was he goes, like 90% of the people that try it don't make it. Like from day one, 90% of the guys are just, they're going to be good guys, but they just don't have what it takes. And you got to be smart enough to do the job and dumb enough to want to. And out of the 33 people that showed up in my prelim course, uh, five of us went to bomb disposal school and three of us graduated. So it was of that. So initial class, yeah, 90% failed. And that was pretty common. So that's, it's funny, but it was the, this is really hard that got me. I don't know why. I don't know. I'm just, I don't know why, but I loved it. Yeah, I'm worried about the same, you know, it's like someone tells me I can't do it. And I'm like, well, let me show you. Yeah. Yeah. In every sense. And the harder it got, the more I, it's an ability I've always had, but the more stressful the situation is, the more I've been able to concentrate. Like when things are, when things are going easy, my mind is all over the map. 
it's when things are just going insanely bad is where I'm like completely clear. Yeah. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a no, that sounds I, like a bullshit statement, but it's not. <laughs> no, it's really not. Uh, I can relate to that as well as I see the you know the other aspect of it. Uh, I've been on several calls where things got a little bit you know interesting, and you would see people that couldn't function. You know, so yeah. it's like that person didn't realize that they had they didn't have that ability until they got put in that situation. And you know, I've seen people just stop getting the vehicle and say i can't get out you know and i'm like you know it's okay but once this calls over and we get you back to the base it's time to get you back to you know right. some other location so we get more support but yeah i'm the same way in that sense like it i don't know like never never really flustered I, me or anything like i, it, it's I an, thrive in those situations i've had this laconic sense of humor where i've always the darker it is the more i've been able to laugh and my wife, Sarah, she has a tendency to get a little annoyed at the fact that I turn any terrible thing into kind of something to laugh at. Like, and I do process a lot of things with humor. But uh, one time I showed up and like the dog had found some something suspicious about a fuel truck, like this big, gigantic fuel truck. And uh, I show up and there's like the beast chaplain is there. And I'm like, holy shit, this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Things are not, things are going poorly. You're not normally here, my man. What's going on? He's like, you need to talk to me about something? I was like, no, and you can please leave. <laughs> if I've got to sort out my emails, it's not going to be with you there. I'm going to be dealing with it pretty directly here soon. But uh, no, it's like the, the fact that I just thought this was really funny, you know, and they're like, yeah, it's 50,000 gallons of fuel that'll go up if you uh, don't do this right. I just laugh. And my team member was like, dude, you literally laughed at danger. I was like, yeah, well, <laughs> which is funny. You got to admit. <laughs> Over the years, you know, I've dabbled in a couple of therapy techniques and stuff like that. And I had a therapist. She's like, I get it. You deal with you deal with your trauma with humor. Uh, that's positive, honestly. I think that's probably one of the better ways of dealing with it. I, I insist. I insist that that's the case. My wife uh, has a tendency to disagree from time to time. She goes, "Can you please be serious?" I was like, "I don't think I can." <laughs> yeah, it's like if I'm serious, then there's a real issue going on. Yeah. Yeah, and there is there are times, you know, you do you do serious up, but uh on the flip side of that, you gotta let go. I think that's why I think that's why we do laugh. But uh, there it is. Yeah, so that's what that's what brought me to the service and that's what brought me to Bomb Disposal. Nice. So look I mean, you're still kinda doing your jam in EOD right now, but looking back yep. on everything you've accomplished, like how do you, like what is what do you feel like? You feel like it was a good decision in life. It, re it was rewarding. Like, like what? Uh, what do you I, feel when you look back on that time of your life? I, I got everything I could possibly have wanted out of this whole thing. Um, like, in 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 every way. Uh, yeah, the, it is hands down one of the most rewarding things I could have done, and it's been ideal for me. That doesn't mean that there weren't significant problems. It's just, I got what I wanted. And that is a thing over time that I've always told myself whenever I was dealing with whatever difficulties. Like you, the thing is, Mike, you always knew this would be a challenge and you wanted it. So that's, I, I got it. I got everything I wanted. I'm a big believer that uh, overcoming adversity makes life more rewarding. And I yeah. would have to agree with that same th statement. Uh, it wasn't easy. You know, there was times that were like really, really tough. But in the end of the day, it made me a better person, made me stronger. You know what I mean? And it's like for that, like, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't imagine a life. Like if you were talking to baby Joe and be like, hey, you know, like, would you th like, what do you think your life could possibly be? Like I have passed that benchmark by a thousand times, like thousand miles, and it's like I'm in a world that I didn't know could even exist, and it's pretty exciting. Yeah, especially being a kid coming from a little farm town, uh, it these experiences have 
basically formed me into the person I've become to where now I'm this guy. I mean, I, I speak foreign languages fluently now, and that came from an interest of going there. I've ridden motorcycles across Asia. I've been to Mount Everest. You know, I've done a lot of really fun stuff, like run with the bulls in Pamplona. It was also partially being formed by the guys that I was around. So even when I was on the flight line, standing there talking to this fighter pilot, where this guy's about to go off and fly a combat mission, but we're talking about just these incredibly intelligent and urbane things. Like these guys, these guys might have well might as well have been medieval knights to me. Like I thought they were so freaking cool, and I was like, all right. How do I fashion myself into become someone like this? And I only decided to do that because I was around that kind of guy. That was this window into what I could be. And some of these guys started out as enlisted fellows, you know? Now they're colonels in the Air Force about to fly an F-16 in the combat. Like, my God, what a cool life. And I found myself in similar situations where you're like, this this is what I wanted. I, I'm here. Yeah. Hundred percent. Like, I mean, I met Dick Cheney and you know George yeah. W. and like all these people. Like, Martha Bush gave me freaking cookies once. You know, yeah. I was like, "Shut up!" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, I ended up playing I didn't know basketball that, that, with Barack could, Obama." Yeah, and I've met yeah, every like, president. I mean, Went to Sunday school yeah. with Jimmy Carter. So yeah, it's really cool. Stuff. <laughs> no, it totally is. I love it. Love it all as well as. Like being in the community that we have, like I feel like that's that's really helpful too. Which is what we're gonna get into next. Is uh, okay. I mean, I have people on here because we're gonna talk about PTSD. So okay. m- the support structure that we have, we have a pretty close group of friends, and we all just reach out and talk shit a lot of times, which is I find the most helpful thing to do. If I live closer and wasn't in Hawaii, I'd be over all the time, you know. And yeah. Yeah, like uh, those guys and our friends, like those, like you guys, elevate me to want to be better. And it was the same way, like when we served together, it was like I, I didn't want to be the weak link, you know, right. because if you were, then it was, you know, you felt like shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, so uh, on the PTSD topic, like I just, I guess we'll just dive right into that. Like, when did you notice that there were some problems? You know, like. I feel like everybody goes through like a phase in life where they're like, ah, you know, like for me, I was like, ah, it's war, you know, war makes people a little bit different, you know, but it took me, I'd say like five, five, six, seven years to realize that, you know what, the world's not supposed to be gray. Like I didn't see a lot of happiness in it and like everything was really dark and depressing. At least that's how it reacted for me. So it was like, I had to go through like a process of like, Hey, you know, like, I don't want to live like this. Like, yeah, I don't feel like life is supposed to be like this. So then, uh, well, as well as I was in a relationship that, you know, if I didn't get my PTSD under wraps or like at least address it, then, you know, it was going to be detrimental to that relationship as well as I've seen the negative impacts on like a lot of my relationships and friendships too. You know, I was isolating myself, distancing myself, I think mostly it was because I was embarrassed of who I was becoming and I didn't want to say or do anything to insult or hurt people, you know? So like what, what things did you key off on and be like, Hey, you know what? I, I want to make positive change. Well, so I did multiple deployments, came back, everything was just fine. It was, uh, one, a, a little later or when I came back, I just slowly found myself completely disengaging from, and and primarily it was work. Like my life was, I have an incredibly strong marriage and I'm married to an extremely understanding woman. So she saw the change when I came back. And I think a lot of guys find that is it, when you're over there, everything, that is the new normal. And for some reason it's super easy to acclimate to that as the new normal for me. And then when you come back, when you come home, then you're like, no, no, this is normal, but it doesn't feel normal anymore. You know? So, uh, 
I had, you know, you, you come back and this career that I was working on had been put on hold. And now I'm just supposed to walk back in and now I'm just supposed to do this job. And I didn't, I, I didn't want to. Like, it just, it didn't work. I'm like, this is stupid. Like, this is a stupid way to make a living. Like, I, and I was a financial, yeah, I liked being deployed. Like, it made more sense to me to make the living that I was making from that work. And then here I am, like, as a stockbroker, and I was like, this is dumb. Like, I don't like this. And from one, I went through a couple places where I, and eventually I just stopped being a stockbroker and was just like a banker. And which is below my skill set. So I'm underutilizing, basically I'm spiraling down. And Do you think it was because it was easier? You know, I found myself in a few industries and career paths just because it was like effort to reward, you know. I didn't have to put in a lot of work because it was really easy, yet I would make good money, you know. No, it was even worse than that. And really what it was is just complete, I don't, I don't give a shit. I just don't care. I just don't care about this. And I, I just needed to care again. And the my wife was like what is going like not a confrontational way in a very serious she said i want you to be happy what's going on and really the thing that also was happening was that i had an event where it was a disposal lot with a very large demolition four thousand pounds and it was on a controlled range but basically the frequency manager for the army base had not approved the new equipment that they had already shipped off the old equipment. So we weren't allowed to use the new remote uh, firing devices. So the uh, radio controlled firing devices to set this off. So we had to use time fuse. So no big deal. We're on a hill. We can see for 14 miles, everything's clear until three Marine CV-22s land within 50 yards of our shop. So, and we're a mile and a half away, and we've got time, but not a lot. We've got time, but no time to waste. And when you do these shots, there's a lot of assorted stuff that you put on top of there, just in case everybody's listening, because this is an EOD. And yet, when you unpack everything, there's just a ton of, ton of trash, like a ton of garbage that just gets put on top because you just blow it up. It's no big deal. So I'm waiting. It burns up into nothing. It just goes away. It's gone. Rather than pack up hundreds of pounds of trash, you blow it up, and it's just gone. So um, I'm waiting through. the. So we get down there, and I, I, I get out because I'm the highest ranking guy, and I send the other, the other fellows. I'm like, just drive, man. Just drive as fast as you can to get as far away as you can because we do not have a lot of time. And the trash, wading through all of the trash to get to the primary, I mean, to the detonating, uh, the, the blasting caps there, uh, the thing I remember the most. So, you know, I get, I get it all done, and I had literally seconds left. And so what happened is uh, I immediately, after coming home, I, was, I would wake up every single night, between 3 and 3.15, having relived that experience. So getting ready, getting ready to uh, have this conversation, I, I did the simple math. Every night after coming home, I waded through that trash 1,800 times. Every night for five years. And basically, I'd relive that every single night now some nights i just like oh crap you know i made it and i just roll over and go back to sleep uh some nights i'd be up for an hour some nights i didn't go back to sleep uh some nights i made it some nights i didn't you know but i waded through that trash 1800 times so i a lot of days i just get to work and i just i just didn't freaking care I'm like, this is stupid. I'm exhausted. 
Like, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. Like, nothing matters. And when you're trying to have a productive career, it's really hard. You know, hanging out with some guys, and then three weeks later, they're freaking wallpaper paste. You're like, that sucks. And then you it and and then you feel bad because it doesn't affect you as profoundly as you think it should. It does later, but you don't you don't have the time that day. And it, like even the worst thing is like even telling that story where I t- told you about those guys. Well, those guys got sent forward to Urbeal and they got they got schwacked like six weeks later. So I mean, there was never an end. So you're just like, uh, so when you come back and then you're getting yelled at, I mean, this is such a a cliche, but it's true. You're getting yelled at by your middle child because you didn't get, you got the skippy crunchy peanut butter instead of the skippy creamy peanut butter. And you're like, really, (laughs) really, really? (laughs) Like, this is what you're going to do. Yeah, this is what you're going to get in my grill about today. Crunchy peanut butter is good. Learn to like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I did not run into issues uh, with family. My family, I, I compartmentalized it real well, but my wife knew things were going poorly. And I'm not a, I don't, I'm not a hothead, which is kind of typical for you of you guys. And, um, so I never took it out on them, but they would say, yeah, that came back a little, a little different, but uh, career wise, things were just going real bad, but, and I just, I'll just keep going on this since it's front of mind though. The problem is I have an ongoing military career, so I did not have the ability to reach out and get any help. Right. I, I was going to touch on that eventually because uh, I don't know if things have changed. I've been out quite a while now. But I know when I was in, every time I came back from a deployment or even after every concussion or, you know, time their vehicle was blown up or we had a significant event, it was like, like literally we'd have a mental health professional and like not jokingly foot tap and be like, you have to answer all these questions correctly. And if you didn't answer them correctly, then they would uh, stop you from doing operations. You were, were then a desk jockey, you know, like you did ops, until you did the radio. You, you might, exactly, until you get medically discharged. And you, you, we get in these career fields and we fall in love with it. Like for me, I didn't look for EOD, but when I found it, I was like, holy shit, there's a whole bunch of people just like me. You know, I was like, yeah. you weird bastards. <laughs> it's like family. Yeah. And then on top right. of that, you want to like, you want to do it. There's nothing I've ever done in my life that felt more natural than EOD. So it was like, you know, it was as easy as breathing. So like you tell someone if, I don't know, I, I've always hated how reactive we are about PTSD instead of proactive. So it's like, instead of it being something that we anticipate happening when you see a traumatic event, it's like, oh, when, you, when you've when you had enough, then okay, you're done. There's no recourse of improving that situation or that mental health. And I've always hated how the military was set up in that fashion. Yeah, and then you got a guy like me who's got 15 years in. I've got five years to go. I've got enough points that even if I didn't, at that point, even if I didn't get any more points, I was looking at a 34% retirement as a reservist. I'm already going to make, you know, so it's five years later. I'm over 20 years. I'm, a, you know, it, it's a different situation. But at that time, you're like, just put your head down, pretend this ain't happening. If you don't acknowledge it, then you don't have to say yes. And, you know, but you, you also, there's a financial component to it. I put a lot into this, and you worry about it. And you seeking help, you're like, all right, I don't have to seek help for five more years. I'll be okay. Except the rest of your life is melting down around you. You know? Like, in that five years, like, something I thought I wanted to do is completely gone. And, you know, you're like, geez, the least. And if you look at it, how it fully maps out, I mean, there's a point where before I finally managed to get myself to a point where I was able to get help, I went from being, an ex- like, a stockbroker and an executive with a major American company. I got a degree. I'm getting my MBA. 
I'm doing all of these things to where I am literally just driving the Uber. And you're like, just, I'm just, I'm checked out. I am just completely checked out. See, and my life melted down completely around me. And I was just holding on until I could find help. But in that time frame, you're looking at a guy like, holy crap, this guy just turned to shit. So, yeah, and that's kind of where I think, and that's what the making people wait does to them. You know, like, I have no idea what all, what, if I were in my current mindset, my current frame of thinking, I don't know what I would have done a few years ago. I'm happy with where I'm at now, but at the same time, that's after going through five years of reliving a trauma every effing night. And it's funny because when I did finally, like, just, all I did was just talk to someone, but I waited till I was over 20 years. That way, if the Air Force heard through any, found out about it. <laughs> Isn't it crazy how afraid we all were? Yeah. I And the thing is, they were able to, when the help came, it was so effective. It was so quick. And I went from not sleeping for five years to I sleep like a baby every night. And it was just simple, simple advice. But just the rebound in my life since I was able to reach out and just talk to someone. And they just go, dude, you're not insane. Like everyone goes through this. And yeah, dude, you wake up after almost dying every single night. Of course, you don't think nothing matters. It's like, and then when it's just like, this is your brain coping with these terrible things you've seen. And then they're just, just hearing someone say, it's okay. The dreams went away. It's weird. But, but it's five years, you know? So... Sucked. No, that's awesome. Well, it's awesome now. Uh, that's what I'm hoping to do, like, with this whole thing is, uh, in addition to talking to people, I want to reach out to resources that are external. So, I mean, one day, sure, I'm going to have some VA people on here, I hope. But uh, my my big thing is trying to find resources that aren't involved and won't impact careers, you know, so people can't start getting help and not waiting, you know what I mean? Yeah. And maybe even like find some sort of resource. It's like, Hey, you can be anonymous, you know, cause I feel like it's not just military, you know, look at the cops and all the stuff that they just went through in the last few years. It's like, as well as like, I know cops personally who have really struggled with PTSD issues and, they don't have any resources whatsoever, and it's just my no to think about those guys. Zero, you know. It's like, oh well, they didn't go to war, and it's like, well, yeah, they you did. know, they didn't every come day. back from war. They live, they every day they live in their war zone because they see the atrocities that the rest of us have no idea that they're even real, yeah. you know. Well, and the distinct advantage, and I will say this, like. um I mean, I, I suffered professionally, and there, there was an impact on my life from that. Um, it was, and the thing is, I'm actually, one of the benefits I have is I, I'm supported with good, good friends. So I had friends all around me, and a lot of guys don't have any friends. So I couldn't imagine going through the last five years without my support network. I just cannot cannot understand how it would have turned out different for me, but it would have gone way worse. And it probably would have crept into my marriage and my uh, parenting. And I, uh, my marriage stayed real strong. And I credit my wife for 85% of that. But uh, just having those friendships, having that uh the relationship with the family, my brother and I are very close. So that was what got me through. And that was my therapy. I didn't do a lot of self-medicating. I got, I stayed out of that trap, which it's easy to fall into. And I, I hope, but uh, there's just so many avenues that present themselves that just aren't helpful from the outset. And I just, went cold inside 
um, on anything outside of friends and family. Yeah, I, I did too. I didn't have a lot of good experiences with uh, the medical while in the military and the VA after the military. It just wasn't something that, uh, I mean, there's aspects well, of it that were helpful, but for big picture, not really at all. Like I came back from well, Afghanistan after being blown up and I was like, uh, I asked them to keep me on orders until we figured out what was wrong with my eyesight. And they said that I was uh, nearsighted. I just didn't realize it until after I was blown up. And I was like, that's stupid. <laughs> you know, and I was no, like, I don't think that's no, the you thing. And then, <laughs> <laughs> right. And then the lady sat me down and she's like, listen, I can't put you on orders any longer because you don't have anything significant. And I was like, what? I was like, I, my eyesight is absolutely garbage. I can't read road signs. And I could. Uh, nine months ago before I left for this deployment and I was like I have headaches I can't remember shit and she was like listen I have people here that are dying from diabetes who have cancer and those are the ones we're keeping on orders not people like you you look like you're in great health and, I, and that was back in the day before I guess TBI was really a big thing so that kind of put me off yeah. and then that's also well, when well I was going to piggyback on that and this might be something that people listening to this may have encountered too. And uh, the fact that I did what I did in the reserves, it, there's this big, giant, bright, bright, red, blinking R. Oh, you're a reservist. It's like, yeah, I was in the reserves, but I served. If you look at my active duty time, I have, at this point, it's 16 and a half years worth of points. I mean, I'm going to retire with nearly a 50% retirement. And the thing that I'm bringing to you, well, I have it. I was put in for the Airman's Medal. Like, there was an investigation of this incident. There's, there's a package I can give you in regards to this. And they're like, listen, the fact that you're a reservist, we don't really have anything to offer you. This isn't something that the VA is going to give you as a benefit because you're a reservist. I was like, whoa, whoa. Is because I did what I did as a reservist, even though I'm activated, there are no VA benefits available to me because of that. And they're like, no, you are not entitled to any VA benefits. That was an ab ab absolute out and out lie. But the people telling me that, well, they were one of those agencies that help you get your VA package together. So these are people whose entire job is to get you into the system. And they're telling me there's nothing they have to offer me. And I'm like, man, one, I'm, I've been around enough to know that you're lying to me. But if I weren't, I would feel despondent. You know, like imagine someone who doesn't know that that guy is a filthy liar and that that's not the case. You, I, what, what do I do? What do I do? I am less than garbage now because, and it's not just reservists. It's going to be Marines get treated like trash and no one treats a Marine like trash more than other Marines. How dare you seek assistance, right? There's like this dog eat dog mentality amongst the Marine Corps. I've seen those poor guys treat each other like trash. Um, like though, there's like these little subcultures in the military and almost all of them, eat each other alive and what i'll say is like that none of that was true i just needed to find someone who was willing to give me the time of day in order to help me find the help i needed yeah and, uh I, when i started this journey i started seeing a lot of uh things that you're talking about uh you know i did a lot of active duty before reservists and then i did reservists just because i didn't like my new flight chief <laughs> so i palace chased and got out of there but uh, mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of active duty people that look down on reservists. I see a lot of reservists that feel like they didn't do enough. Or I even see active duty guys that are like, I didn't deploy enough to like open my mouth and like say that I had any sort of issues. And the thing is, is uh, I feel like, you know, hey, if you're having problems, go get help. It's that simple, you know. Like the biggest yeah. hurdle for me to get help was my pride. Once I made peace with that getting help, you know, and like going down the path of like finding out what improves my life. That was actually pretty easy. Well, I, I, 
I've, I'm participating in this whole project as a way to try and benefit others. But uh, I, I think there has been some improvement to the system. And I'm going to be real candid about this. I, I feel like there's been some improvement to the, the way we regard people who are seeking assistance for, oh, you just got your bell rung. You just got your bell rung. It's like, no, dude, like my brain got smashed around inside my skull and it's trying to heal and it doesn't know how to deal with this. Maybe some medical advice would be cool. Well, the military, they don't like that. They just want to shove you out the back door. I, I'm at a point now where there's been some improvement, but I don't really necessarily, and I know a lot of other senior NCOs that don't necessarily feel all that confident that uh, the military has our back even now. Like, you, you notice that I'm talking to you after I have 20 years in the bank. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, I mean... I don't think I was irrational to worry. So I'm not, I just, I really want people to just seek assistance though. Cause the thing is that five years was expensive. Yeah. You know, and I'm not talking money. I mean, that's five years of my life where I risked my marriage, my time with my kids. Yeah. I lost my career, my, uh, civilian career like it's gone you know if i still wanted that that would be a significant tragedy so the seeking of help if you're one of those guys who's thinking like all right i'm going to put it off until and I'm like all right you're running a risk though and it was expensive to me it's expensive time wise yeah i was getting ready to ask like if you were to do it again what would you do differently don't waste that five years. I mean, that's what I would have done. Yeah. Because I look back and it was it was expensive for me because I struggled trying to get processed through the shit that I did to other people. You know, I wasn't a very pleasant person. I was a bit aggressive. You know, like I used to drink in excess. I did a lot of, I partook in substances, you know. Like I did just about everything you could think of trying to like heal that or I guess more numb that and you know it was i wish i would have just i swallowed the pride except the fact that hey you know this isn't the way i want to be how do i improve that yeah you know there's a there's a few things and i would say with my kids in particular i i feel like i did as well as i could have done without getting help for myself but you know i did i did fine my kids and i are getting along great but when they get around and they talk about a particular time when something happened and they go, yeah, dad, that was, dad was with PTSD. Like, I don't like that that's an inside joke amongst my kids. It's actually kind of not nice, you know? But they were like, yeah, you know, that would have been right after that one deployment. You know, dad was all PTSD for about 18 months. They're like, great. <laughs> I'm glad you all saw that. Right. <laughs> Doing well in life. Nailed it. It was obvious to literally everyone. The 11 year old is like, Yeah, dad's a little on edge. I don't know what happened over there, but he'll be okay in about nine months. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's expensive. Like I said, that's expensive. It's not a, like, as a family, we are the laugh it off kind of people, but it's, uh, there's, that's pain. That's pain I gave my kids in some fashion, you know? So. Yeah, my number one advice, don't wait. Or, or find a way to seek help for yourself. I mean, you know, if you're on TRICARE, dude, do what I did. Spend the 250 freaking dollars. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's worth it. Well, if, if I'd have known that it was like less than $1,000 to just talk to someone on my own dime, I wouldn't have waited five years, you know? <laughs> right <laughs> what a moron and then there's there's non-profits and stuff that uh that are available too and i'm trying to get in contact with some of them have them come on the show and be like hey this is what we provide and just give like maybe 250 is expensive for somebody you know yeah. but you know there's other options too and i'm hoping to like dive deep into those eventually once i get better contacts for them 
But yeah, like I'm the same. Like I look at my family and I know there was a time there that uh, my family was like terrified to communicate with me because they didn't know how I would like yeah. react. And because of that, I isolated myself from them. I distanced myself from them because I didn't want them to be upset. I didn't want to be the reason that they were upset, you know? So yeah, man, don't wait. It, it it's hard re reestablishing those relationships, especially like someone like me who let it go for so long. And it's like, yeah, and, like the sooner the better. And there's one thing I wanted to say, and I actually wrote it down in my notes, getting ready to talk to you too. It's like one thing that put me off for the longest time is I couldn't stand the idea of uh, like doing uh, like Prozac or whatever the heck that they were going to give me. Like I just couldn't stand that idea. And the funny thing is, is I found everything I needed was just conversation. Like with a competent person that knew what they were doing, I never once needed any medication. In fact, I feel phenomenal and just no medication came my way, you know? That's so awesome. the other thing too is if you're like, I don't want to be medicated, it's like I never got medicated. I never needed anything. So putting that again that's another one where you're like oh i put this off for five years to avoid a thing that never happened <laughs> so again just having the courage to seek help for yourself well then have courage to seek help for your kids or your parents or your brother or whoever that's 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 what i would do so that's yeah well i didn't I wish I would have started with therapy because I didn't know what to do. I had no idea what I was doing. And I just went through the VA process like everybody else does. So when I got out, you know, I, I made a file saying, you know, like these are the issues. And they're like, okay, well, here's some medication. Yeah. I think I had four prescriptions. And it was like, okay, I guess I take all four of these every day. So uh, within, I think, two and a half weeks, I was immediately suicidal. Mm -hmm. And like, the mo like, I always had dark thoughts, but this was like at another level, you know? And I was like, Jesus Christ. So I like threw those away and I communicated with the counselor I was talking to. I was like, hey, you know, uh, this is what's going on. So I stopped taking all these medications. And they were like, oh, okay. So they documented in my medical record that I'm allergic to it. And I was like, oh, I was like, is that allergic reaction, suicidal tendencies? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, you guys are insane. But uh, then after that, I started doing what you did. I guess the first thing was meditation. Yeah. And then after that, that led me down a path of like trying to like figure out like other ways to decompress, which led me to therapy because I had no idea. And then after talking to the therapist for a little bit, I mean, that's definitely how I straightened my path out a little bit and started moving in a healthier direction for sure. So I'd encourage anyone who's having issues, step one, just talk to someone, you know, that's the hardest part. And then once you make that connection, cause that means you had to swallow your pride a little bit. And then after that, you know, go for it how you see fit. There's tons of, tons of avenues and we're all different, you know? Well, my wife kept telling me, she goes, I think you need to talk to someone. You need a therapist. And I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm a really happy guy. And I am. And I was happy all day. I just found no meaning in my work, which is, you know, a sign. And then, uh, you know, I just, there was this, there's this stigma, you know, like with a couple things, you know, you're putting it off because, oh, I don't need therapy or I don't need to talk to anybody. I'm happy. I don't need therapy. I don't need to talk to anybody. I got what I deserved. Like I wanted to be there. There was nothing about that situation that wasn't something that I had not prepared myself for right. all of these things you're like oh if you're one of those guys who you know walk away with some trauma from x y or z you know and you're like hey listen i went to ranger school i went to freaking 75th ranger i was there on purpose i was in a ranger bat on purpose like there's you don't accidentally end up in 75th ranger with a scroll on your shoulder you know what i mean like yeah so when things happen to you and you're dealing with that aftermath, another thing, like you don't accidentally end up in EOD tech, you know? Like, so one of my thoughts was always like, well, this is what I wanted. Yeah. Right. Like, this is what I wanted. Like, this didn't happen on accident. And you're like, well, but your mind is still trying to come to grips with that thing. And when you see the human body savagely disassembled, you know, that's 
hard to deal with. When you see the, right, and the thing about the dead is that they look so terribly dead. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's, that's what you take away. And this is the person you were playing spades with two days ago, you know? And you're like, it's just so hard. And it takes years on your own. Well, talking through these situations, as silly as it sounds, like, oh, what, you know, I talk to my wife about my problems all the time. It's like, no, no, no. Competent help. Really, it just fixes things. It does. It really does. So. Nope, I agree completely. Uh, my biggest problem with everything, it wasn't anything that was combative. Like, I never, I don't think I ever dwell on any of that. It's, it's all the innocent people that I didn't, I don't know, I guess I was naive when I joined the military. I didn't put those together oh. assuming that like there was potential of you know civilian people men women kids dying like yeah. and that is what really wrecked me right yeah they don't show that on john wayne that that 50 cal bullet bouncing off a wall <laughs> and slamming while it's spinning like a top into the hip of a random wolf and woman walking by you're like yeah that that kind of stuff man it's it does it sticks with you yeah it really does so you're not you're not weak for wanting to not see that every damn time you close your eyes (laughs) then we can get back to figuring out why we have four kinds of freaking lucky charms (laughs) exactly right (laughs) no that's awesome but uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, I guess I'm going to reach out to Sarah and see if she'd like to jump on, maybe give the perspective of a spouse and how to be supportive for someone that's dealing with PTSD. I think that'd be really beneficial. But, man, yeah, other than that, I think... significant insights. So did you uh, do anything else? Because I wanted to really touch on, like, I don't know, this is just me looking at your life from, you know, a thousand-mile view. Uh it seems like you're a little bit more passionate about your current career choice. You know, like, yeah. do you find that maybe that raised the quality of your life a little bit? Do you, like, what do you think? Cause you went from working in a bank that yes, you hated, you know, you didn't want to be yeah. there anyway to working in your garage where you make, you know, handcrafted swings, <laughs> which yep. is amazing. Like I'm jealous yeah. as shit. <laughs> well, that again, that came from just a friend. The problem is I sought help at a point where what I, working as a stockbroker or a financial advisor, just, it wasn't in the cards anymore. I had imploded that. You know what I mean? So uh, a friend of mine that was a financial advisor, he was just an amazingly good friend. I could always reach out to him for good advice. And he's like, all right, let's, let's wipe away every circumstance. And he's like, if you could daydream tomorrow what job you want to do, what would that be? And he goes, is it being a financial advisor? Like you wake up with some magic and you're going to your job. What is that job? And I told him, I always wanted to just, I I love doing it as a kid. And it's like, I would actually written it on a bunch of um, paper when I was, 20 I wrote 100 things I wanted to do and one of the things was build furniture for a living and there was always this idea of doing it when I was retired and he Joe uh, my my other friend's name is Joe too Uh, he's like go do that and I was like I don't know I don't know if I can do this but you can do it you just gotta figure out how let's spend spend the next 20-30 minutes talking about how and we just came out with a plan. And I talked to Sarah and I was like, I think this is what I need. And she's like, let's do that. You know? And it all just, I, again, I, I have the benefit of an extremely strong social network. So it made sense to everyone around me. It's like, Michael, do it. It's a hard thing, but Mike does hard things all the time. It's just do that. And that's where I'm at now. Where now I'm building this lovely little business and I make three different types of furniture and I do as much of it as I want. And that's, 
that's that. Um, it, I couldn't ask for more, but it did, it did come from good advice and the courage to try, but it all came from the fact that this other job that I had planned on doing for the rest of my life had been wrecked. <laughs> Absolutely destroyed. Do you, I'm trying to think, do you think it, that career choice, like being deployed, seeing all, all that and it changed your perspective and maybe you just didn't value uh, like that career path anymore. You know, I don't know. Like that is absolutely. Okay. The case. No, it was a hundred percent. Absolutely. The case. So, I mean, the thing is I liked it. I liked doing it. I thought it was fun. I thought it was interesting and the money was great. And then when I came back, I'm like, awesome. I'm helping a guy that's got two houses, get a third. What the hell is the plan of this? Oh, he's got a Maserati, but he wants a Maybach. Fantastic. Let's make this make this ass hat some more money. Yeah. Like I couldn't figure out I, I've been trying to figure it out for years, like what I'm passionate about, what I wanted to do, because as soon as I left the OD, like I've just been kind of floating around, you know. Uh I did school and try to do i think i was doing software engineering because you know it's challenging i like writing code i thought it was pretty neat and like ideally i was like maybe be fun to like create some video games but i took some english class and i had to write a paper on ptsd or some shit and that resonated with me for years and i couldn't stop thinking about it couldn't stop thinking about it and then all of a sudden like it eventually evolved to this and i was like well you know, I really find PTSD and the mind fascinating as well as trying to give back to the community. And like, in my mind, that's rewarding, you know? So it's like, I find that valuable and we have only so much time on this earth, you know? So I don't want to do some shit that doesn't fucking matter, you know? Like I want to do something that like makes me happy. And that's why like, I don't know, maybe that's, that changed my perspective for over there because well you and i basically ended up in the same place like the thing that's making us happy but i think on the other side of this journey i hate that term because my wife watches this show called the bachelor <laughs> anyway but on the other side of this long and winding road uh basically you and i both ended up in this place where we're actually in a position to actually seek our own joy in life again and you know i geek out about wood and I geek out about designing things, but I'm also working with guys who geek out about custom forging iron. So like the handles and all this, but I'm just basically spending my days geeking out on stuff that I have just this overriding passion for. So now I just, on the other side of all this, but I never would have had the courage to demand for myself a career like this. This is something you go like, oh, yeah, when I'm 72 and retired, that's when I'll do it. And I was like, well, I almost died, so I get to do, <laughs> I get to do it now. Right, exactly. Because <laughs> the way it's going for me, I might not make it. But, yeah, it's like I've already – I almost died, like, multiple times. Like, no, 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 I'm not waiting. I'm doing it today. And that, I think that was the other thing, just having the courage to, to demand for yourself now. Because that's the other side of this is, all right, now I went through this trough. I beat myself up to death. I went through all of this garbage. And now I get to demand good things for myself. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm living the life I, I, I want. And I think so many people, I think, I, again, though, that comes from a place of strength where you just, you are, I was literally at the mercy of my brain. When I, my bed was not a safe place for me. You know, laying down is where I was going to meet this demon. And they were going to come to me every damn night, whether I wanted them or not. And uh, then to have, the, to have that demon never show up again, the amount of control I have in my life again, it's just, I, there aren't words. So that, gave, I think, gives me the strength to just demand things for myself that I don't think I would have had I not gone through this. Right. No, I agree. Like, there was a time where I was so down and negative that I just did whatever I could, you know? And I was like, this is all I can get. Right. And I don't know, like, eventually, like, going, 
like everybody's path's going to be different to get their mind right. And once I finally got my mind right, waking up and not feeling like you want to kill yourself and actually feeling like a normal human being is like, okay, now I can actually have goals and dreams and ambitions because then you're not just trying to make it to the end of the day. You're like, okay, so there is more to this than just tomorrow. You know, at least that's kind of right. how my evolution happened. Yeah. Like I'm at this point. And this just sounds like weird humble bragging, but like I've never actually been as clear as I am lately. And I literally, I, I literally live in every moment because there isn't this, that thing that was in my life, I have taken care of it. And now I don't know. It's like you ever put off a thing that you dread and you're just putting it off and you know you're not doing the right thing like ah oh, crap i've got to do my taxes let's say and you know you've got to do it and you know the deadline's coming and you, you dwell on it you're not living in the moment going to bed for me was that like every single night it's like i haven't slept in days i've got to sleep this is a thing i have to do not having that is now you're like and then once you finally file your taxes that feeling you have of like oh god thank god that's over well now i have that literally for the rest of my life <laughs> that, is, <Yeah>. that is my <laughs> feeling every day now it's like oh here we go <laughs> so <laughs> right <laughs> why did i wait well, that's years? awesome and you humble brag the shit out of it because you know that's that's what we're all like shooting for you know yeah to get to that point where it's like ah oh. I can just live my life, and that's basically where life. I'm at, you know, just smiling, yeah. loving it. That's awesome. And do you have, like, a website or anything for these benches and stuff like that, or do we just, I, if somebody wants one, they just reach out to you personally? Yeah, you know, I'm not going to use that this format to talk uh, to talk about that. They can go on the Instagram, and all they have to do is look up. The uh, gram. Yeah, they just look up uh, uh, Swing Beds. And I'll be one of the ones that show up, but uh, that uh, awesome, yeah. I uh, I I, I, don't oh, I love really, it. I really want to use this format to try and plug a business. No. <laughs> no, it's totally cool. I just like supporting veterans and their new adventures in life. You know, it's awesome. It's positive, and I like it. It but is sweet. Yeah, I uh, I, I it, it's for anyone who has ever been on instagram it's a bunch of assholes doing pictures of themselves doing pretending to live lives that pretending to be living lives that they don't actually live and uh i have become this weirdo like wood monk to where i'll pull a timber out of a building that was built in like 1820 and just Spends 500 words talking about the beauty of this stupid old nail. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's journey to your house. <laughs> yes, yes. And I just do these long expositories <laughs> on how beautiful this stupid nail is. And uh, it's, it's actually been a really nice outlet, too, because I just, instead of trying... I'm doing a real shit job of promoting my business on Instagram, but I'm doing a great job about writing rapturously about the bark on a live oak tree. So I, it's been another fun, but I, uh, I very low on the douchebag quotient. I'm, I'm really trying hard. <laughs> no selfies. In That's Kansas amazing. Kansas. <laughs> right i want a selfie of you like doing some woodwork all sweaty <laughs> oh there's plenty of that just absolutely drenched in sweat covered in sawdust with nothing but a smile yeah. it's hilarious nice awesome well i'm gonna wrap it up is there anything else you like to throw out there no i think i've uh just uh i think i've hit on it pretty pretty candidly as far as i can but uh i don't wait I get, yeah, I, I want to like maybe just real quickly. So you spoke to the therapist and then after yeah. that, like, was there anything else that you implemented in your life to raise the quality of your life or anything that you did other than just speaking to a therapist? So it, it really, it, it's funny to me and I, I'm going to use this as a moment to just sort of unlock to people who've never been to therapy and to people who are extremely skeptical of it. 
which would have included me. Every time my wife was like, dude, you just need to talk to someone. I was like, shut up. You're an asshole. Shut up. That's dumb. Right? No way. I'm. That's for pussies and liberals. Yeah. And <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm like, absolutely want nothing to do with this. And uh, the thing is, when you sit there and you have a conversation with someone and they just listen and you kind of go through and like, I think this is what it is. They're like, ah, it, tell me about this. Tell me about that. And they kind of put you in a couple of different directions. But the thing the the thing is, we so often, we think we're all alone. We're like, we're the only person to ever go through this, and there's something wrong with us. This is me. There's something wrong with me. This is my problem. This personal ownership of this is like, no, you have a human brain, and human brains work a certain way. And this is how your brain is processing this trauma. That forgiveness from that person, that acknowledgement, yeah, dude, waking up every day at 3 a.m. is fucked up, you know, <laughs> like just laying down and not wanting to go to sleep because I was going to have to wade through that garbage again tonight. And they're like, no, dude, this is your brain processing that trauma. This is just how it works. Like being able to just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation candidly about what was going on and then them just kind of like, no, here's how, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. It gave me forgiveness or like permission to be better. I don't know how, for me, it was just, it, it somehow worked out to like, my mind gave my, per, my brain permission to get better. It was like pieces of, there's a commercial on TV where there's this dude that's like crossing a crosswalk. And then all of a sudden he starts wrestling with like an identical copy of himself in the middle of that crosswalk. And it's like, Jesus Christ, like that would literally me like in the, okay. I'm sorry. I know we've been going a while here, but no, man, no, I got so, nothing but time. You go was, as long as you want. I was single a few years back and I'm sitting in a bar in New York and I meet a young lady who is just the kind of young lady you want to meet in the bar. And we're talking about college sports and she was from Alabama and I'm from Georgia and things are going great. And then you, she tells me that she's a kindergarten teacher. And I did not realize that in the middle of a, a perfectly pleasant conversation with this person, I just, turned into a blithering idiot and my eyes tear up because my brain went to this stupid freaking place where I had seen like nine five-year-olds blown to shit. So I'm a weirdo, this perfectly normal guy that she is trying to have a decent conversation with. Well, in her mind, it's like, this guy's just another freaking weirdo. You know, I mentioned kids and he tears up and like just starts to be turned to be a blithering idiot. I was embarrassed and I kind of like get up to go to the bathroom and then she won't even talk to me anymore. So now I feel like a real weird. Guy. And it's one of those things like I couldn't control that. Like that wasn't my fault. And but I couldn't tell her what happened either because she won't even talk to me. Right. So the, just after years of that kind of thing, you you got to give yourself permission. You're like, I'm not weird. I'm, I'm not weird. You know, like my mind is always my mind. I drink a little bit too much. And then I end up freaking in the woods behind my friend's house crying for 20 minutes. <laughs> like, there. That's not a normal thing to do. I get right. it, but I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to think about that thing at that moment. I just wanted to get this woman to give me her number like I didn't know we were going to talk about little kids, you <laughs> <Right>. know. <laughs> yeah, like, it's one of these things. Like all these things compound over years to where you're just like, God, I'm a weirdo, and you're not. You're not. You're just. You're not a weirdo. You've got a human mind. You just got some unique shit that happened. You know, like I'm the same way. I always get. It's all right. To, it's all right to have those problems. 
you know, you, we've experienced some of the most unique things in the world, you know, so it's, it's all right for us to like not have moments that are like you uniquely odd compared to those individuals. I feel like only now at 45 in the last two to three years ever started having non-military friends. Like every friend I had ever had had jumped out of a helicopter at two o'clock in the morning and thought yeah. that was great. You know what I mean? Like, and that's still it, cool, but it's still cool. But I hate fast roping. I, still, <laughs> I hate it with a passion. Yeah, me too. It's so hot on your hands. But uh, no, it's just I'm just now I think getting to a point. But that that guy going through that crosswalk, he's just walking down the street, and all of a sudden his stupid mind is wrestling with him about some crap he didn't even do you know i didn't do anything with those kids i just saw them why can't i continue talking to this beautiful girl about something that we're both interested in why do i have to turn into a soup sandwich and i don't know but you have a human mind and it's just built to take so much trauma and i don't know like, I don't know what my life would, I honestly, at this point, don't know what my life would look like had I been able to seek help earlier. Yeah, but same. I would I have been know. in a different path for sure. I don't know. We are where we are now, and hopefully. Yeah, we are where we are. Yeah, I, I try to, like, when I look back on things, uh, I take the lessons to be learned from it. And then the rest of it, all the things that, you know, I can't remember who said it, but. Looking back in the past and looking at the alternate outcomes of what you could have done is basically just conspiracy theories with yourself, you know, it's no yeah. benefit to that. So life lessons move on, you know? Yeah. I got, I don't know. Life's, life's awesome. So yeah, fuck the past. You might've made mistakes. Yeah. You know, shit happens and you know, we can't control what we did then. All we can do is control what we're doing right now and moving forward. So Right. That, that's all there is to it. And it doesn't make you a weakling to to seek help. I mean, I've seen guys, I mean, we've seen them like they'll, they need help in a moment, you know, that's it. Like the, the fact that you're at second ranger bat doesn't mean that you didn't see some pregnant woman cracked open like an egg. You shouldn't see that shit. You're not supposed to see it. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, messes with you and it's okay in fact it's even better that it is messing with you that means you're not could, a psychopath <laughs> right <laughs> could you imagine if that didn't bother you now right. we got some shit to talk about now we got some shit to talk about eh? <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm I mean, slowly going to start distancing myself from you, Mr. Man, who's okay with dead children. And yes. uh, I'll be over here. <laughs> right. We're digressing, but it's all right. That's what it's all about. I just want, my goal is to just make this to where like people can just talk about this shit. You know, like I feel like so yeah. many people, like, I have lots of friends. They're all different spectrums on, on the process and stuff like that. And there's some that are like, you know, fuck therapy and you guys are mentally weak for suggesting it. And I'm like, well, you'll eventually get there. And they do, they have, I have friends that are like, yeah. they have gone through the process where they're like, fuck, you know, like they're where you're at and saying like, I wish I didn't wait, you know? Yeah. And there's other people like I've got on the list to talk to that, you know, they're what they did to heal is very outside the box thinking, but it worked for them. God so, bless yeah, them. We're going <laughs> to, right. We're going to touch on all of them. So, yeah. yeah, man, I really appreciate it. And I love you, buddy. And I uh, can't wow. wait to be there doing some old fashioned sitting next to the fire with you guys. Well, I hope that in some way, just me explaining some of this makes it okay. And the thing is, this is the last thing I want to say you can keep having your career, you know, like I, I'm doing great. I'm still around. Like I, the thing is the people who I saw that did not find help eventually who did allow themselves to melt down, they're the ones that lost their careers, you know? So however you need to do it and you make good conscious decisions about what's right for you, but 
yeah, like maybe the military system isn't the best one, but just seek help. Just don't do what I did and have five years of hell or however long it is. Just just whatever your route and listen to other people. They did other stuff. But uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's something we didn't hit on at all, which I think is the biggest reason that I wanted to do this, is because people who don't get help, they their lives end, you know, whether it be their careers over, their relationships over, or they just find themselves addicted to drugs or alcohol, or they literally kill themselves. And I've had too many friends die, and I, I hate the fact that there's so many people suffering in silence. You know, it's like. Like, I know what it feels like, and that sucks. That's a shitty place to be in your life, and it can get better. The, the, last thing, the last thing I'll say is also don't accept no, because the worst feeling, and in my process, the worst I ever felt in this whole thing is when I finally worked up the courage to seek some help, and then that help was denied. Like when I reached out and I was trying to figure out what the VA can do and they're like, you get nothing. I'm like, I felt horrible. The only thing that helped me through that was that there were people around me who were like, that guy's full of shit. But if I didn't have those people, I'd be like, all right, well, that's that. You know what I mean? And then without any avenue to get better, I don't know what would have happened. I definitely would not have turned around and been very productive. That's for sure. Yeah. You know? I remember my yeah. first experience with the VA and to reiterate on that, like if you, if you go to like one therapist, you know, and it's really not what you thought it'd be, or if it wasn't helpful. Cause mine, it was some VA guy in a Wahoo and he was like, uh, so PTSD and TBI is kind of like a five-year-old kid that touched a hot stove. You know, every time you come into the kitchen, now you're going to be worried about touching a hot stove. And I was just like, sir, if you compare me to a fucking kid touching a hot stove again, we're going to have issues. You know, so like if you don't succeed with the first attempt, you know, they're all yeah. different too. So try again. Yeah, it's like some guys, man. I don't know. It's like they get in there with the agenda of making you feel like a pussy. And you're like, thanks, Ace. I've got a freaking pile of sand you can go pound. How about that? And yeah, so it's never helpful when you come out of it, like, frustrated and mad. And just understand, like, there are people who are shit at every job. And they, the, the other thing, too, is they, get, like, they make you feel like you're trying to run a scam. Because a lot of people are. And we've all met those people. There are a lot of people doing it. And so everyone's on, when you go to the VA, they're like, ah, well, you're just another scam artist trying to get 1800 bucks a month for PTSD. And you're like, or, 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 or I'm trying to get better, you know? And they, they, unfortunately, the filter on that isn't all that great. So try, try, try. Once you get the courage to actually ask for help, now you need the courage to get the help. I don't, that's, that's the thing, man. Like you're going to run into, I, I, I hesitate to say it this way because it may make people hold off on seeking help, but you're going to kind of run into a little bit of headwind. <sighs> that's just, you're shopping, you know, you're going to run into an asshole car salesman when you're buying a car. You just you got to find out how to get to the help you need, but you need to demand it because on the other side, finding it, Christ, I wish I started shopping around 20 minutes after I got back. Yep. Same. Yeah. I wish it so was that, that easy to get to. And that encouraged. It's like, okay, I think it's Israel that does that. Where when they come back from some sort of combat-related mission, like they like give them therapy. They process them through as if they did have PTSD, you know. And it's not looked upon as like some bad thing or weak thing. It's like, yeah, we're being proactive about it. I wish that's how we treated the combat right. veterans and cops nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Like if you you hear about Canada where they bought that hotel in Cyprus so that their guys could just go fuck it up for ten days and then go home to their <laughs> right. family. You're like, I love where your headspace is, yeah. but I don't think that's very productive either. Right. <laughs> I'm sure it made them feel better temporarily, but it didn't instill like things that improve their yeah. life forever. But yeah, hey, if that works for you, do it, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly.
But, all right. All right, man. Love your face, and I'll talk to you soon. And with that, we're going to wrap things up with Mike. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Sorry for the audio. Uh, There's a static in the background. I had a faulty cable. This was one of my earlier recordings. And, uh, yeah, I never want to ask anyone to do a chat again. So I touched it up where I could. But uh, it is what it is. But, anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you have any positive feedback, shoot it my way. And, yeah, look forward to continuing this tomorrow. All right, have a good one.